Mark chapter 2. We've been talking for quite a while now about discipleship. We've been doing a series called, I wish he didn't say that. And we're talking about all those statements that Jesus said that we really wish he didn't say. Because how many of you know that Jesus didn't throw his words around loosely? The Holy Spirit moved upon these writers many, many years ago to record certain facts about human history and God's interaction with man and so on. And they were recorded for a reason of all the things. As a matter of fact, you go to the end, I think it is, of the book of John. And uh, John actually makes this statement. He says, if everything Jesus actually did was written down, he said there wouldn't be enough volumes and libraries and space in the world to hold it all. You ever thought about that? If everything, that, in other words, what we've got written here is not everything Jesus did. It's not everything that Jesus said. But it was the stuff that the Holy Spirit wanted us to know because it was important for us to get a broad picture of who God is, who we are, and how God interacts with us. But it's not absolutely everything. God is so much bigger sometimes, I think, than we give him credit for. But we've been looking at the statements that Jesus made that we wish he didn't say. And hands up in this room, if you've come across... Absolutely nothing Jesus said that you wish he didn't say. There's a lot of things that I wish he didn't say. I've got two choices. Either I just quickly skip past those passages and just go, I'll get to them at a later date. How many of you know that I still haven't come up to that later date yet? I'll I'll probably never get to the later date because there are so many other fun things in there that I like. So I stick and dance around the stuff I like that that probably fits the mould of who I am today right now more so than those things that he said that require change and transformation for me to become. So we've been looking at those statements for quite a while. What I want to do is just change tact a little bit today. I want to start to put a little bit of legs to this thing called discipleship. The, The gospel is not a means by which I should be seeking to get blessed. It's a means by which I learn how to become a blessing. It's it's not about me getting information about God. It's about me being transformed by God. There's a process of change that takes place in my life. And so I want to spend the next few weeks just trying to put a little bit of legs to this thing called discipleship. On a practical level, how does it work? What does it mean? What's it require? Does God just come and zap me and make me feel like being the person he wants me to be? Or do I have a part to play in that process? How many of you know, wouldn't it be wonderful? I want you to think right now about your biggest weakness. What's that one area of your world? And don't shout it out to me. But what's that one area of your world where you look at it and you go, you know what, I know that this part of my world needs transformation. I know that where I'm standing right now is not where God wants me to be standing. I know that the, the struggle that I'm facing here is something that I know my Heavenly Father wants me to walk through and overcome. Think about that area. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we could just pray for an anointing from God to come up on you and bang, it was clear? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it have been great for Jesus to just go up on that mountain and pray? And the father spoke to him 12 names and he brought the 12 together. And instead of saying to them, you guys follow me. In other words, you've got to do a bit of stuff here. You've got to flex your leg muscle. You've got to come with me. There's a bit of unknown about it because I'm not telling you everywhere we're going. I'm not telling you absolutely everything before I do it. This is going to be, I, I like to put it this way. The, 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 what I do here on a Sunday morning is called just in case training. Just in case, I'm going to teach you some things this morning, just in case you ever need to use it. How many of you have have, have sat through a message here in other churches, sit through on a Sunday, and some Sundays you go, that whole thing was just for me. Ever had that? And you just go, he's reading my mail, she's reading my mail, they've been reading my email, I'm sure of that, that's spooky, but they know things they shouldn't know because that's just me right there. Ever had that experience? And then there are other ones where you sit there and you go, that was so for Jackie, I know, that because that, I know the issue, that, that was for her. I hope she heard all of that, and if she didn't, it's on iTunes, it's on YouTube, I'll make sure. And I've taken notes for her too. 
But you know what? Because I'm a good Christian, oh, there was, I can always take something out of it. So I go away, I can always take something out of it. But, but sometimes it's, it's all for you, but quite often we're listening to the Holy Spirit and, and, and in a 20-minute, 30-minute message, there might be one statement that resonates and you go, that's God for me. I'm going to sit with that one this week, Lord. Speak to me. Percolate that. Let that seed plant and germinate. Sometimes it's like that. You know why? Because what I'm doing here is what we call just-in-case teaching, just-in-case training. But Jesus did what I've referred to as just-in-time training. He actually walked with the disciples and situations would arise and in the moment as they're facing a situation, he would turn to them and he would say, what do you guys think we should do? He would turn to them and say, why would you do, why did you do that? How do you think we should handle this? And so the way that Jesus discipled people was not just come and sit in a classroom and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of information just in case you need it. He did life with them and he walked with them. And as situations would arise, they would say, why, Jesus, why could we not cast out that demon? And Jesus would say, well, let me tell you something. This one comes out with prayer and fasting, depending on which translation you're reading. What he's saying is, is, is there something here that you didn't know? Jesus sends the 12 disciples out on their first missionary trip and they go out. And they come back and they're all pumped and excited and they say to Jesus, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You didn't teach us that, Jesus. And Jesus goes, no, because you know what? You learn this stuff as you go. But I want to tell you something, calm your farm a little bit. That's exciting, but don't get pumped about that. Get pumped about the fact that your names are written in the book of heaven. Be more excited about the fact that you have to... So you, you, you go through the Gospels and you see that Jesus did his teaching and his training, his discipling, just in time and not just in case. Does that make sense? So I want to talk about what it looks like practically for you and me now. So the rubber's kind of going to meet the road here. So I'm going to spend a few weeks and talk about some stuff that's a little bit closer to home. And so whereby you've probably been able to sit back and go, yeah, that's great, yeah, that sounds good, yeah, I can wrestle with that, that makes sense. Now what I'm going to say is, okay, if all that makes sense, here's what we do with it. Is that okay? Here's what we do with it. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. It says, and again he entered Capernaum. And after some days... And it was heard that he was in the house. I love that. The, the, anyone got a new King James Version that says, uh, and it was heard that he was in the house. That's kind of cool, isn't it? You know, Jesus is what? In the house. Yeah, anyway, that's just the way my brain ticked. I read it. I thought, that's so cool. You were thinking ahead, weren't you, to 2020, to the young people, Jesus in the house. Anyway, it sounded way better when I read it to myself. <laughs> Jesus was in the house. And immediately many gathered together so that there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. So there's a massive, massive crowd of people that are coming to hear Jesus. And he preached the word to them. What word? We'll go back to Mark chapter 1 and Jesus is starting to say to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. So he's preaching this message to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, it's been a wild week this week. Okay, um, I don't know if you heard, but Donald Trump lost the unlosable election. The New South Wales Blues lost the unlosable origin match. Quiet. Whoever that was. There's a door right there. Unfortunately, there was another big event this week, and I, I don't want to just brush over it. Some of you may have heard on the news that another, uh, and this is becoming common, unfortunately, another high-profile Christian leader has, has made a mistake, fallen. Now, first of all, our response to that is not to criticise and not to judge. I don't live that man's life. I don't walk in his shoes. My response is to pray for him 
and to pray for his family and to pray for his church. Don't get caught up in the gossip and don't get caught up in the cycle of negativity. We pray for this guy. That's what we need to do. Every one of us, we need to pray for him, pray for his family, his kids. But again, it got me thinking because this is happening so often in our world. And I wonder whether it relates back to this issue of of discipleship. I wonder whether it relates back to the issue of who we... So here's the thing. God is more interested in who I am than what I do. We talk about the purpose of God, and we're very big about that, in, 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 especially in the Western church, especially in Pentecostalism, about the purposes of God, the will of God. What's the purpose of God for your life? Let me be very clear. And if you don't believe me, read, read, this, read these ancient manuscripts. The primary purpose of God for your life is to become, not to do. The primary call of God upon your life and my life is to become the person he wants us to be, not do the things he wants us to do. Being happens before becoming. And when becoming, uh, sorry, becoming happens before doing. And when doing gets so far down the track that the becoming hasn't kept up with it, we find ourselves in trouble. And, And you might not be a headliner in a newspaper because, and I might not be, but it doesn't matter how many people know about it. It's the fact that it's happened. It doesn't matter even how many people are affected. We go, oh, it's so bad that he did it because so many people were affected. Well, I don't care if Joe Bloggs next door has the same failing. There are still people that are impacted by it. You see, my, my obedience impacts more than just me. My ability to become the person God wants me to become impacts not just my life, but it has a positive impact on the world around me. My inability has an impact not just on my life, but it has an impact on the world around me as well. Every one of us are on a journey. None of us have made it. None of us have made it. I don't care whether you're, you're sitting here and you feel like you're, you've just came to Christ a week ago and you're so full of stuff. and you, Look, you're on a journey. I don't care whether you pastor the biggest church or run the biggest mission agency in the world. You are still not there yet and you're still on a journey. It's funny. Professional sports people. It's professional golfers who hit a stick and a little white ball and, 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 and tennis players who are at the top of their game who are leading the world in a sport. You know what they do? They have a coach. And what does that coach do? Try to make them better at the thing they're the best at. They've got a coach, somebody in their world that can speak into the world, that can help them get better at the thing that they're already the best at. Why? Because they know they can still be better. You know, I often wonder with us as believers, the most important thing in our world... Uh, uh, I'm just saying the way that I read this, the most important thing in our life should be our relationship with God, for out of that flows everything else. My walk with the Lord, my ability to be what Jesus called me to be, which was not a pastor, was not first a father or first a husband, first to be called a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And if I get that right, the benefits of that flow into my fathering, they flow into my husbandry, they flow into me being a better pastor, a better leader, a better preacher. It flows out of my ability and my relationship with Jesus. Him. We're all a work in progress. And I wonder how many of us have that same passion and that same understanding that my relationship with God, my, my formation into becoming a disciple is so important. Do I actually have that kind of space in my world where people speak into that part of my life? Do I prioritise that and see that as important? Because I know I see other areas as important. I'm ringing up my financial advisor, help me make more money, help me be smarter with my money. I'm ringing up my sports coach. Oh, I know I made a mistake on the weekend. What can I do? Help me get better at that. I'm going to business seminars. Make me a better business person. But what am I doing in terms of my personal relationship with God and my formation in terms of becoming a disciple of Jesus? What place of priority does that actually even have in my world? This gentleman made a statement on Twitter, and I just want to quickly jump on a couple of things. He said... When you lead out of an empty place, you make choices that have real and painful consequences. So he was leading out of an empty place in his life. When I read that, I thought how sad it is that he was leading out of a place of emptiness. Did anybody know about that? Was there anybody close enough to see that empty space that you were leading out of? Was there anybody close enough to speak into that empty space in your world? Were you open enough to allow someone into that empty space and to see that empty space. I don't know. I just read that statement and that was my first thought. 
But he followed it up towards the end of his tweet and he said this. He said, this failure is on me and me alone and I take full responsibility for my actions. And the one thing I thought was great is, is that's exactly right. He's taking responsibility for what he did and responsibility for his own growth. And every person in this room, I want to say this to you, in terms of your relationship and walk with God, you have to prioritise it and you have to take responsibility for it. God won't zap you from heaven. A prophet's not going to come with a word that's suddenly going to make you want to become all that God wants you to become or do what he wants you to do. A, A great word from an international prophet can pump you up for a couple of weeks, but I've seen too many people go, oh, he prayed for me, they prayed for me, I got a goosebump, you see that I fell down. I saw a vision of an angel. I know people that have seen visions of Jesus Christ himself and still turned their back and walked away from him. None of that stuff is going to make you become the person that you need to become in God. You've got to take a bit of ownership for your growth and the direction that your world is taking. You see, this man's actions came from where he was as a person. There was this place of emptiness, and out of that place of emptiness, he said himself, he said, I made dumb choices. I made dumb choices. Your purpose is first to be, and secondly, it's to do. And we've got a saying in the world, and it's this. You know, you ever seen those people, they're running around busy all the time? And we say, slow down, you're a human being, not a human doing. Anyone ever heard that? Slow down, mate. Look at him. You're a, you're a hip. We've got a neighbour like that, lovely guy. I, I don't even know if he knows how to bend his knees and hips. I mean that because I've never seen him do this, ever. He's always walking around, pushing mowers. He just does not stop 24-7, does not stop. I don't even know if he can bend over. (laughs) You're a human being, mate, not a human doing. Slow down and just be for a bit, would you? But isn't it funny, then people come to faith, they come into our little gatherings and we straight away go, ooh, what can they do? (laughs) Hey, get moving. You're not a Christian being, you're a Christian doing. Start doing something for the Lord, would you? Come on, hurry up. Get out there and tell people about Jesus. Pray more. Read more. Serve in the kids' church. Make the coffees. Thank you in the church. Come on. What do you think you are, a Christian being? Yeah, that's what we should be first and foremost, is uh, Christian beings. Our purpose is to be first and foremost. So what's a Christian being? Well, Jesus described a Christian being as a disciple. Well done, Ruth. You're lucky you're in the front row. I would have moved you forward. <laughs> Actually, why don't you come up on the floor here? And I'm on the stage. A Christian being is a disciple, and that's what we're called to be. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul writes this to Timothy. He says this. He says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What's Paul saying to Timothy in this statement. He's saying two things. He says, sometimes, just like the man in the story in Mark 2, sometimes, Timothy, you're going to be lying on the mat. Someone's going to carry you. The things that I've been speaking to you, Timothy, things I've been saying to you, things I've been showing you, things I've been been, been teaching you, you've needed them because you didn't have them. So, Timothy, sometimes you're like the paralysed man on the mat. And you need people to carry you. You need people to carry you. Who likes to be carried by other people? There's just something in our culture that doesn't like that, eh? We don't want to be carried. You know why? We grow up in a culture, particularly in the West, where maturity means independence. The more mature you get, the more independent you become. Can't wait to turn 18, flick mum and dad live by myself, do my own thing. And everyone knows that don't happen, eh? They're ringing you up every second. I've got no money left. I've got no food. Can I have some fuel for the car? Can I come back? That's not fun. Not as much fun as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Sorry, we've rented your room out. <laughs> Mum and dad are high five and got him. <laughs> That's not true, by the way. That's not how it works. I'm just being funny. But we think... That the goal of human existence is independence, to get independent. Yet then we come to this, this, this faith. We come to this man, Jesus, and he wants to disciple us and teach us something different. It's not about independence. We actually rightfully come to a place where we become somewhat dependent on one another. 
Isn't it interesting that my left foot is not independent of my right hand? Of all the analogies that, 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 that Paul could use to describe the, the church, he, he uses this thing called a body. In other words, if I cut my finger off and I don't heal it up and sew it up properly, my foot's going to end up in a bad way as well, even though it's got nothing to do with it. Why? Because we're so connected. We're so connected. The blood that runs through this finger eventually runs through that toe. Unless my anatomy class was wrong and uh, could be, but the same blood flows through. We're a body and we're actually joined and we're connected. And, and what every joint supplies contributes growth to that body. This is the way that Paul described it in Ephesians. So sometimes you're lying on your own mat. The things that you have heard from me, Paul says, that's Paul's input into Timothy, Timothy's life. But then he also says, the things that I've taught you, he says, commit these to faithful men. In other words, sometimes, Timothy, you're the guy on the mat and I'm carrying you and that's my input into your life. At other times, Timothy, you're the guy carrying somebody else on a mat. And that's the input you have into them. So we see that Timothy was not perfect. Paul's saying, you've got room to grow and room to move, so I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to input into your life. But here's how it works, Timothy. You don't just sit there and suck it all in, baby. You've still got a part to play. I'm going to be inputting into you and you're going to be inputting into somebody else. So discipleship becomes this in front and behind process where we've got somebody that we're taking somewhere with us, but we've also got somebody taking us somewhere as well. So you've got to learn not only to give to somebody else, you've also got to learn how to receive from somebody else. So many of us here, if I gave you a choice, do you want someone to carry you on the mat or do you want to be one of the guys carrying the mat? Nearly everybody in this room, most people can say, oh, I want to be the one carrying the mat. Well, guess what? You've got your own areas of paralysis in your life. And so do I. You know how I know that? Because I'm not in heaven yet. I'm still a work in progress. And so are you. Sorry to burst your bubble. We've all got those areas in our life. So sometimes we're lying on the mat being carried. Sometimes we're required to carry somebody else. And that's what discipleship is. If I was to ask you right now, who are you carrying right now? Could you answer that? In other words, who are you discipling? Who are you, who are you picking up on your shoulders and taking them somewhere? The thing I, I, that fascinates me about this story is that... It, these men that picked up that man, imagine if they just didn't come by his house. You see, he was healed because other people took him to Jesus. Left to his own devices, he probably wouldn't have got there. He needed other people to take him there. And I need you in my life and you need me in your life. We need each other. He, he's, I, I, you all know how good I am at maths, all right? I've stood up here many times and counted 1 plus 1 equals 12. Okay, so you all know I'm terrible at maths, but I have come up with an equation that I want to share with you today. I oh, know, Jackie, just calm down. I've come up with an equation. Here's my equation. Um, what's the first one there, Luke? You plus me equals weariness. You plus me equals weariness. Okay, if I want to get involved in your world, if I want to disciple you, and all I've got to give you is me, how many of you know you're not going to go far? If all I've got to give you is my own resource, my own wisdom, my own experiences, my own level of empathy, my own level of care, my own pastoral gift. <laughs> if I've only got what I've got to give you, then I'm not going to be able to take you very far. I'm certainly not going to be able to take you to a place of healing. When we were in Bangladesh many, many, many years ago, one day, uh, we, we woke up one morning, we were in Bangladesh doing a visa run while we were living in India. We came out the front of our hotel, walked down a laneway, and there was this gentleman that was placed on a mat at the end of the laneway. And you pick every single joint in the human body, I'm not exaggerating, was broken and bent backwards. We found out later it was done by his family when he was a child. So they could just place him on a mat on the side of a busy corner. They could walk off for the day while he got money and they would come back and take the money. They were using this guy for profit, basically. You know what? If all you want is the resource I've got, if you only want to go where I can take you in myself, I can't take you to a much better place because I don't have it all together myself. 
So if we're depending just on one another, then you and me equals weariness. We're going to tire each other out. Because I'm not going to be able to give you the answer you need, the solution you need. I can't bring the healing into your world. I'm a work in progress too, remember. So if it's just left to my own devices, I'm not going to be able to do much. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4 and 5, Paul says this. He says, And my speech and my preaching. This is when he came to Corinth to preach to them. Now there's a backstory to this I don't want to get into, but I just want you to see the point, one of the points he's making here. He says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. In other words, I didn't want to come and just give you human wisdom. I could have baffled you and given you a bit of stuff. I'm a trained Pharisee. I know this ancient document, so I'm pretty good at talking. But I don't want to just baffle you and give you what I have to give you. Why? Because at the end of the day, I don't want to give you what I give you because I don't want your faith resting in my abilities. I want to point you to the one that can change your life. So I'm not relying on my resource. I'm relying on the power of God. So I'm pointing you there so that your faith will rest there. So you can sit with me and we can spend time together, but don't look at me as the full stop. Look to God through me, in me, whatever, but I'm not the full stop. If you're looking to me, I'm going to get tired and you're going to get tired and we're going to go nowhere. You and me equals weariness. I'll give you a second equation. You and God equals weirdness. You and God equals weirdness. I'll tell you what, that's good, aren't they? See how I've done that? The the equations linked them up? Pretty impressed, aren't you? Oh, no, she is. You and God equals weirdness. If it's just you and God, how many people do you know? Remember Paul talks about us being aliens and strangers. Remember that passage? We're aliens and strangers. I've met some of the aliens in church, I'll tell you that. I've met them. I've met them. Phone home. They're weird. They're strange. It's just them and God. Oh, God came to me last night, gave me this vision. You know, I saw a cabbage patch kid. And by the way, God can speak to you through a cabbage patch kid. Of course he can. That's not my point. What I'm saying is there are people out there, if we isolate ourselves in our whole, everything we know about our growth in God, if our whole discipleship journey is just me and God and I cut you out, it's going to lead to one place. And that's weirdness. Me and Jackie worked many years ago with a guy. His name was Alan, actually, funnily enough. <laughs> Any other Alans in the house? His name was Alan. And, and we were leading a youth group in Bundaberg, and Alan was, was part of that particular church, and his kids came to the youth, and Alan came and, and, and played a bit of a support role with us with the kids. Cut a long story short, eventually, Alan started getting on, on uh, TV and watching all the televangelists on TV. That's all he did. Well, over a period of time, he cut himself off from his church, stopped going to his fellowship where he was, and just said, I don't need that now because I've got all these televangelists. So he started staying at home and watching all the televangelists. Well, the next thing you know, he's getting out of bed in the morning, having his cup of coffee at 9 o'clock, and going into a room while his wife and kids are there, 9 o'clock, locking the door, staying in there all day, watching one TV evangelist and teacher after another. And he did it all day. It was like his job. Next thing you know, he's coming out of the room and he's visiting local pastors in Bundaberg saying, I've I've got a word, the Apostle Paul appeared to me this morning in a vision and told me to come and tell you A, B, C. Follow on a little bit further than that, he had a visit to his house with these guys with a white van and a jacket. Looks like it goes on backwards. They took him to a psych ward. He ended up in a psych ward because he just thought, I don't need any of you. I just need God. I've got a Bible and all these tele events, but I don't need any human interaction. I don't need, need, need you around me. See, here's the thing. I believe that when I'm in your world and you're in mine, you give me a visible representation of the invisible God. God loves you, Pauline. He loves you, Paul. Now, that's wonderful. That sounds great. can make you feel warm and fuzzy. Some days, other days, you can like, whatever. But when I express love to you and you experience love through me it's a visible picture of how an invisible God feels when you do me wrong Elaine not that Elaine would ever do anything wrong to me ever she's perfect but if for example's sake Elaine did something wrong to me and then came and said sorry and I said you know what look I forgive you there's grace you don't have to earn my favor let's get on with life You're getting a visible picture of what an invisible God does when you come to him. You take the human interaction out, we lose the full picture. We lose the full picture. This man ended up in a psych ward. 
because he felt like he didn't need anybody else in his discipleship journey. It's not true. You and me equals weariness. You and God equals weirdness. But I like the last one. You, me, and God equals wholeness. Now, come on, who's impressed with that? I, I strung that together myself. Come on. I even did. Yeah, come on. Come on. Give it to me, baby. Hey, I even did the over, what do you call that? PowerPoint. I even did them myself. Hey, the place should be erupting right now. Yeah. Yeah, there's just, just to the right of the nest. You, me, and God equals wholeness. You know, even I can sit there and listen to you. But here's the thing. I, I know that I'm not just listening to my own. Ex- I'm trying to listen to God when I'm with you. I, I, I know that even if I can't relate to whatever it is that you're talking about, whatever your problem is, I know there's a resource greater than me and I'm going to point you to him. Hey, let's pray together. Let, let, let's, let, let, let's, let's pray together about that situation. Let's, let's, let's get into the word of God. Let's have a look. Let's see if we can find, if we can find any advice or any tips in here that will help you in your journey to overcome that or, or your struggle with that or whatever. You, me, and God together brings wholeness. Discipleship is about you, me, and God. This man in the story, Mark chapter 2, if he was left to his own devices, we might not even know that he existed. But he had some people in his world, a small group of people, four men, that got out of bed one day. Imagine being that man. I, 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 if I put myself in his shoes and he's laying on his mat, imagine what it must have felt like. Barry, get up. <laughs> Just joking, we know you can't. That's why we're here. Jesus is in town. Come on, boys, grab a corner. We're going to take you there because he couldn't get there himself. How many of you have ever been like that? You just had a moment in life and you knew you just couldn't get to Jesus yourself. You were emotionally depleted and drained. It was gone. You are a spent force. You had nothing left. You needed someone to come alongside and knock on your door and say, here's the thing, I'm going to pick you up. I'm not going to pick you up just to take you to my place. I'm going to take you to Jesus. And as a result of that, you were kick-started again. Maybe your faith was reignited. Maybe hope came back into your world. You know, that's what discipleship is about. And that's what God calls us to. There was a miracle that took place in that man's life, but there was also movement. And here's something I want you to think about. Wholeness doesn't necessarily come to you. You go to it. If you're sitting back, thinking I'll become the person God wants me to become because it'll just all come to me. You'll be the same person in 10 years' time. You've got to play your role in the process of your own discipleship. Wholeness doesn't come to you. You go to it. And quite often, God uses other people to help us get there. That's discipleship. Let me just leave you with those two thoughts. Number one, who's carrying your mat right now? Who's carrying your mat right now? And those areas where you're struggling, where you're broken. Those areas where you're failing, those areas where you know you're not overcoming, and you know those areas. Who's carrying your mat? Who's carrying your mat for you? And secondly, whose mat are you currently carrying? Because if everybody in this gathering had somebody carrying their mat, and if everybody in this gathering was also carrying somebody else's mat, boy, could we move. Boy, could the church go somewhere. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit and your presence with us. And I pray for each person uh, here in this room right now, God, whatever seeds that you've spoken to people, Lord, whatever things you've dropped in their spirit this morning, Lord, whatever word that you have wanted to say to them, whatever thing you've wanted to show them this morning, I pray as they get up and leave this place, Father, that they wouldn't just rush off to lunch or rush off to the next thing. God, I pray that they would think about and let that seed take root and let it grow, let it produce fruit in their life. Father, we love you. We love you, God, and we want to be transformed and we want to be changed and we want to not just be a bunch of religious people to gather on a Sunday morning in a building because we've got nothing else to do. Father, we want to be the church. God, we want to be that movement that you birthed 
2,000 years ago, that movement that was meant to shake the world, that movement that was meant to transform society, nations, business, science, politics, arts, education. Father, that's who we want to be. So God, just continue the work that you're doing in our lives. And Father, as we leave this place this morning, I pray for each and every person here that knows you. God, give every one of us an opportunity in the next seven days to tell somebody about you, God, somebody that up to this point doesn't know how much you love them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen.